Okay. Can y'all hear okay? I'm uh, Mary Buffington. I am a nephrologist here at uh, LSU University Health. And for my grand rounds, I wanted to talk about the cardiorenal syndrome. And I have no disclosures, and the objectives were revealed before. In 2004, uh, the a report of the National uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute defined cardiorenal syndrome as a condition in which therapy to relieve congestive symptoms in heart failure was limited be because of decline in renal function. Okay, and they looked at that as a, a based on GFR or an increase in creatinine. But over the years, it, the thinking was that was too limited a definition for the interaction and crosstalk that occurs between the heart and the kidney. And so uh, a new uh, definition was put forward in 2008 that defined it as a disorder of the heart and kidneys whereby an acute or chronic dysfunction of one organ causes an acute or chronic dysfunction in the other organ. And so there are five types of cardiorenal syndrome, okay? The first two involve uh, the heart affecting the kidney. So type one is acute cardiorenal syndrome. That's where acute heart failure leads to uh, uh, an acute kidney injury or a worsening in kidney function. Uh, type two is a chronic cardiorenal where chronic heart failure leads to the progressive uh, development and, and uh, uh, persistence of chronic kidney disease. Type three and four involve uh, disease in the kidney affecting the heart, and type three is acute renal cardiac syndrome, where the acute kidney injury causes an acute heart failure. Uh, and type four is a chronic renal cardio uh, syndrome, where chronic kidney failure leads to chronic heart failure and uh, CKD progression. Type 5 is a secondary cardiorenal syndrome where some systemic process like uh, severe sepsis will cause uh, a dam injury to both the heart and the kidneys. Okay, So today I'll talk mainly about t type 1, maybe a little bit about type 2, but type 1 is the main one that we'll be looking at today acute heart failure leading to an acute kidney injury or a, an acute worsening of renal function. So the pathophysiology is neurohumeral adaptations, reduced renal perfusion, leading to increased venous pressure and a right ventricular dilatation and dysfunction. And so you have, you do have this crosstalk where you have an acute heart uh, process going on that leads to a decrease in cardiac output. You get a decreased perfusion uh, that uh, affects the kidney. You stimulate the uh, uh, renin-angiotensin uh, system to uh, cause vasoconstriction, cause uh, increase in uh, sodium reabsorption through angiotensin II and aldosterone. You also have sympathetic activation for increased sympathetic tone and also increased salt uh, reabsorption. Also, there are hormonal factors and other factors involved. And so essentially, uh, this is, uh, you get a reduced uh, stroke volume, uh, reduced cardiac output leading to uh, uh, decreased or, uh, or arterial underfilling and uh, then the processes that are provoked in response to that lead to elevated atrial pressures and a venous congestion. So looking at uh, just the circulation, arterial circulation is about 15% of total plasma volume. And this is the part that regulates sodium and water excretion. And when you have a decrease on this side, you get the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, RAS, uh, uh, release of vasopressin that causes increased salt and water retention. Venous circulation is 85% of total plasma volume, and those vessels are very compliant. So as you have enhanced sodium reabsorption and increased water retention, the, that is going to fill those vessels. So it can lead to the uh, in elevated atrial pressure and venous congestion that really is thought to be a key factor in cardiorenal syndrome. 
Um, so activation of these processes uh, preserves uh, perfusion by maintaining blood pressure and perfusion, increasing cardiac uh, contract uh, contractility. Uh, systemic response increases cardiac afterload, which by increasing the afterload, you can reduce cardiac output, and that can lead to a decreased renal perfusion. The uh, adaptations by RAS and sympathetic nervous system tend to overwhelm the other processes involved, like natriuretic peptides, nitric oxide, prostaglandins, and bradykinin. So uh, reduced perfusion, essentially, uh, usually that's not because of a low blood pressure. There is a, a database of people with acute heart failure and uh, less than 2% had a systolic blood pressure uh, less than 90. 50% uh, had a systolic blood pressure over uh, 140. So it's not low blood pressure that's causing it. Um, and you have to be careful um, um, because if you have heart failure with a decreased cardiac output, diuresis can actually reduce the preload and decrease cardiac output. And this is seen by uh, this uh, Frank Starling curve. This is normal, a normal Frank Starling curve where you have a normal uh, cardiac output here. If you, you know, reduce the um, preload, then you are going to have a decrease in your cardiac output. Now looking here, with people who have mild cardiac dysfunction, at the same left ventricular end diastolic pressure, they would have a much lower cardiac output than someone with a normal Frank Starling curve. So they have to increase that pressure, the wedge pressure, they have to increase that through these neurohumeral adaptations to, to get their cardiac output back up to normal, okay? And people with severe dysfunction may never have a, a normal cardiac output, okay? But you can see with this flatter curve, if they have a cardiac output right here, and you diurese and you reduce that preload, their cardiac output will go down a little, but you will not have the dramatic fall that you would have here, okay? So they tend to kind of tolerate a, a diuresis a little better. Okay, so what is causing the worsening renal function in acute uh, heart, uh, decompensated heart failure? You get decreased cardiac function uh, that leads to all of these processes, and then venous congestion really is thought to be pretty significant. So in that setting, what is the significance of having a worsening renal function? When the creatinine goes up, the GFR goes down. What we found is... Uh, you have to make a distinction between uh, decreased uh, renal function at baseline and then a, a worsening of renal function that occurs as you're treating that patient and you're diuresing and you're, and you're taking off the fluid that they don't need. If the uh, renal function goes down in that setting, that's very different from having a uh, decreased GFR at baseline. So if you have a decreased renal function at baseline, it looks like, uh, you know, from the literature that that leads to an increased risk of mortality. However, if you have someone who's very volume overloaded and acute decompensated heart failure and you're diuresing them effectively and their renal function worsens, that does not necessarily lead to increased mortality, okay? because that it's actually the therapy that they need to improve and get out of that acute decompensated state. So looking just at the prevalence of chronic kidney disease at baseline, there is the ADHERE uh, uh, registry, more than 100,000 patients with acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, essentially, it was a retrospective chart review that was in, entered into a da database, and of those people, 46% had an ejection fraction more, more than 40%. So it also includes people with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What they found was there was chronic renal insufficiency in 30% of the people in the database, and that was uh, 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 serum creatinine more than two in 21%, serum creatinine more than three in 9%, and 
people on chronic dialysis in 5%. And so here again, this is the place where I got the information. The low systolic pressure is not the cause of uh, the uh, acute decompensation in the vast majority of patients in the registry. So what is the prognosis for these patients with a reduced GFR at baseline, okay? This is a meta-analysis uh, that is looking at the prevalence of renal, fa uh, renal failure and heart failure par uh, patients and the their mortality. 16 studies, 80,000 uh, patients. They had 63% uh, had renal impairment of any degree. 29% had moderate to severe impairment, okay? And they looked at mortality at up to one year or longer. So people with no renal failure had a mortality of 24%. Renal failure of any degree, uh, the mortality jumps up to 38%. Now, if you look at renal failure moderate to severe, that's a, a creatinine more than 1.5, their mortality is 51% uh, at one year, okay? So that's pretty high. This is with the reduced GFR at baseline, okay? So there is an incremental increase in mortality as the creatinine increases, okay? So this is significant. This is, if somebody has a baseline CKD with heart failure, their mortality is pretty high, okay? Now, it's not necessarily the same in someone who has uh, acute decompensated heart failure and then they go into, they have worsening renal function during that treatment. And some of the data that was initially uh, backing this up is from the ESCAPE uh, database. That's the evaluation study of CHA, CHF and pulmonary artery catheterization. It was a prospective trial that, you know, used either uh, clinical assessment or pulmonary artery catheter, catheterization and those hemodynamic measurements, uh, you know, using that uh, pulmonary artery catheter to direct the treatment of these heart failure patients, okay? There's about 433 patients at 26 sites, and what they found was that the pulmonary artery catheter really was uh, not of benefit uh, in terms of uh, getting a better result in treating the uh, decompensated heart failure, and it led to more, actually had more adverse events. And so that was, kind of, that was the result of that trial, but a lot of people have done post hoc analyses of this data since then. So you have the data of these heart failure patients, half of them which had pulmonary artery catheterization at the time, okay? And they did a post hoc analysis of the impact and pathophysiology of renal dysfunction in these patients. And uh, in, this, in this study, they excluded a creatinine more than 3.5. They defined a worsening renal function as a serum creatinine increase of 0.3 or more, okay? And 29.5% uh, uh, of the people in the study met that definition. But what they found was neither a decrease in the GFR of 25% or more, nor an increase in the serum creatinine of 0.3 or more were associated with an increased risk of death or rehospitalization at six months. So the worsening re uh, renal function in this setting did not lead to a higher mortality, okay? Then they looked at the patients randomized to the pulmonary artery catheterization arm, and they found no correlation between their baseline serum creatinine or GFR and the baseline uh, wedge pressure cardiac inde index or systemic vascular resistance. And that suggested that the worsening renal failure that they had during their treatment was not simply related to the poor forward flow uh, or excessive vasodilatation, okay? They did find a weak correlation between baseline serum creatinine and right atrial pressure and GFR and right atrial pr pressure, which supported the venous congestion etiology of uh, cardiorenal syndrome, okay? And they also found some predictors of worsening renal function was uh, hypertension, diabetes, and in-hospital use of a thiazide diuretic in the univariate, but a multivariate analysis, it was hypertension and thiazide use. So what they 
said was that the pre-renal etiology was because of because of low forward flow of overdiuresis or excessive vasodilatation is not the primary determining determinant of worsening renal function. Okay, a possible explanation was that they had a baseline hypertension and diabetes that made them more prone to have a worsening renal function, and also baroreceptor dysfunction and neurohormonal activation causing the vasoconstriction led to uh, uh, decreased blood flow and, and uh, GFR. Um, so essentially impaired baseline renal function but not worsening renal function was associated with adverse outcomes in these patients. Okay, so you make that distinction. Other uh, things kind of telling us venous congestion is a big factor in cardiorenal syndrome uh, well, acute cardiorenal syndrome, is that uh, increased renal venous pressure can reduce GFR. So having a CVP of 20 reduces the GFR 25%. Also, elevated intra-abdominal pressure was associated with renal failure. And uh, uh, as they reduced the uh, intra-abdominal pressure, the renal function uh, improved. Okay, so that is kind of another marker of venous congestion there, increased uh, abdominal pressure. Tricuspid regurg has been associated with a lower GFR, which is more uh, along the lines of venous congestion. So other indicators of uh, worsening, what are other indicators of worsening renal function during your treatment? Okay, so this is another analysis of that same data, data set, that same study with looking at clinical uh, judgment versus pulmonary artery catheterization to treat acute decompensated uh, heart failure. And they look at, looked at indicators of hemoconcentration, like uh, increase in hematocrit, increase in albumin, increase in total protein. So a, aggressive diuresis produced kind of a hemoconcentration that you would uh, you would that should be present if prerenal AKI was the cause of the worsening renal function, and it was strongly associated with higher doses of loop diuretics, more fluid loss, reduced filling pressures, and worsening renal function. This uh, hemoconcentration and the aggressive diuresis. However, these patients with hemoconcentration <clears throat> had significantly lower. 180 day mortality. So yes, their kidney function is getting a little worse, but their mortality is much improved by the aggressive diuresis and the relief of those symptoms of volume overload. So despite worsening renal function, aggressive diuresis and hemoconcentration was associated with substantially improved survival. Also, they uh, looked at the, in the Everest trial, where uh, that was placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trial, looking at the role of tolvaptan on clinical outcomes in people with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And uh, they were looking at cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization for heart fail failure. And uh, they did a... Uh, post hoc analysis of this, looking at hematocrit chemistries, uh, body weight, and uh, they defined hemoconcentration as a 3% or more absolute increase in hematocrit. It occurred at 26%, and it was correlated with an increased risk of in-hospital -hosp worsening renal function, but the renal function generally returned to baseline within four weeks of discharge, okay? And the patients were less likely to have clinical congestion at discharge, had greater decrease in body weight and BNP levels. So for every 5% increase in hematocrit change was associated with, with a decreased risk of all-cause death. And it also was associated with uh, decreased cardiovascular mortality and uh, uh, heart failure hospitalization, which are really good things. So we're talking about an, an improvement in mortality even though you're seeing a worsening of the renal function during the treatment. And uh, this was a really interesting study. They looked at tubular injury bio biomarkers in people who had uh, decompensated heart failure and were treated uh, with uh, diuretics. 
okay? Uh, they looked at levels of NGAL, uh, uh, NAG, and CHEM1 to quantify the injury to tubular cells and worsening renal function. So the thinking is if you have worsening renal function, you probably have some kind of kidney, some kind of tubular injury. And so they wanted to see which of these uh, novel biomarkers, which uh, are di directly released in response to injury, which ones would be elevated. And so all the, this is looking at the post hoc analysis of the ROSE uh, AH, AHF trial. And all the patients uh, were on high dose loop diuretics, uh, 283, and the biomarkers were tested at baseline in 72 hours. Worsening renal function occurred in 21%, and it was not associated with an increase in markers of tubular injury. In fact, increases, the minor increases in these markers that they saw paradoxi paradoxically were associated with imp improved survival with a hazard ratio of 0.8 per 10, per 10 percentile increase. So increases in creatinine that commonly complicates de decongestion of patients being treated for decompensated heart failure may not be driven by a renal tubular injury. So in the ROSE trial, the co-primary endpoints were 72-hour cumulative urine volume, uh, a change in cystatin C from uh, uh, randomization to 72 hours, no difference in biomarker levels between the two study groups, and the patients uh, were, they looked at patients with worsening renal function, and most events were small to moderate sized changes in renal function. Median urine output was 8.4, uh, 8,400 milliliters over 72 hours, and worsening renal function was not associated with worsened 180 day survival. So they got a, a nice diuresis here over 72 hours, had a small increase in the creatinine, and it was not associated with the worsening in survival. So worsening renal function can occur during this diuresis in uh, acute heart failure, and it's sometimes referred to as a bump in creatinine. And it does not seem to be, it may not be a kidney injury. It may not be injury to the tubule. The increased creatinine can be from hemoconcentration or some other hemodynamic changes going on. But what about patients who have more than a bump in creatinine? This is a, a meta-analysis of eight studies. It looked at 18,634 patients and uh, all-cause uh, all mortality with a minimum follow-up of six months. And what they found was that the adjusted mortality risk of heart failure patients with rusty, uh, worsening renal function was odd, uh, odds ratio 1.65, okay? So there is, a, a, an adjust, there is an increase uh, adjusted mortality. But when you divide that up into the magnitude of the increase in creatinine, okay, you look at normal, then class one was a, a small increase in creatinine, and that essentially didn't have an increased risk, okay? So a small bump really doesn't give you an increased risk of uh, mortality. But as you go up higher, uh, increase of 0.3 to 0.5, your risk increases, and an increase of more than 0.5, your, your increase of your risk of mortality increases. So the higher the bump, you know, the once you get to a certain point where it's not, where it's essentially uh, the increase in creatinine is mediated by hemodynamic changes, not necessarily a tubular injury. You can, as as the uh, uh, kidney function worsens more than just 0.3 to 0.5, you do get a an increase in your mortality. So what about the prognosis of people with this uh, worsening renal function in the setting of decompensated heart failure? So in the decompensated heart failure, diuresis is a higher priority than avoiding worsening renal function, okay? Uh, but worsening renal function of a higher magnitude and requiring increases doses increasing doses of a diuretic can be a reflection of more severe cardiac disease, okay? So the mortality, the bottom line is, this is really important, the 
mortality of inadequately diuresing a patient is worse than the mortality of a patient with worsening renal function. Okay? And the studies make this really clear. Uh, you can, the patients who at the end of the study still had dyspnea, still had volume overload, their mortality was really very high. Okay? So the, it's important to go ahead and treat these people and get these, reduce these symptoms of heart failure. Okay? Now during this, during, as people are diuresing the patients, you can reduce diuretics when volume overload improves. You can reduce diuretics if it's, if it's a large bump in creatinine, you can reduce diuretics to see if renal function tends back toward the baseline and just in, in general avoid overly aggressive diuresis. So looking at essentially looking at, so that's sort of the prognosis aspect of this, okay? So looking at diagnosis of cardiorenal syndrome, you have a reduced GFR in patients with acute decompensated heart failure. You want to distinguish whether they have baseline CKD. Is this acute kidney injury due to uh, factors not related to the heart failure? Or uh, is this because of cardiorenal syndrome? You want to look at underlying, look for underlying kidney disease, see if they have active sediment, do they have proteinuria, look at the ultrasound, are they small kidneys? And then uh, typically with cardiorenal syndrome, you'll see a pre-renal picture with the increased BU and creatinine ratio, decreased urine sodium excretion. Uh, if they're on di diuretics, then you may want to do a fractional excretion of sodium and pre-renal is a less than 35%. On physical exam, you may have dyspnea, uh, peripheral edema, rails, and S3 or elevated JBP. So the goal of treatment for this is to eliminate the clinical evidence of fluid retention and elevated JBP and pulmonary edema. And the guidelines put out by the uh, ACC AHA really don't say anything about worrying about the kidney function, you know, it's, it's really important to go ahead and, and address these symptoms and uh, bring resolution to these symptoms. You want to treat with the sodium restriction, fluid restriction, uh, loop diuretics are the first line of therapy. Also there's some evidence that tolvaptan is, is also effective. Uh, if, uh, if they're refractory to diuretics, you can do ultrafiltration. And then also it may be uh, necessary to use inotropic drugs if they're in cardiogenic shock. So looking at diuretic strategies, this is the dose trial. And this gives kind of a, a, nice, uh, uh, a, a nice algorithm to diurese patients when they're coming in with acute decompensated heart, uh, heart failure. This was a prospective randomized double-blind trial, uh, 308 patients, and then they looked at it's a two by two design, so they looked at uh, furosemide administered as a bolus t twice a day versus continuous of infusion. And they also looked at a low dose furosemide, which is you take their home dose of Lasix and you give them the same IV, okay, during their stay, versus high dose furosemide, where you take their home dose of Lasix and you increase it by two and a half. Okay. So they had low dose versus high dose. They had bolus versus continuous infusion. Okay. The endpoints were the patient's global assessment of symptoms at 72 hours and a change in serum creatinine from baseline. And the results, essentially in the high dose group, there was a non-significant trend toward greater improvement of symptoms, but uh, no significant difference in the continu continuous versus bolus furosemide dosing. So this is the global assessment, and you can see that the p-value is uh, not significant. Okay, so they each had a fairly good result in the uh, patient's understanding of the improvement of symptoms. But looking at the uh, uh, change in creatinine, looking bolus and, and continuous, that's non-significant. Uh, non but looking at low dose and high dose, you can see this is quite a bit higher it's still not significant, but there was sort of a trend toward how, having a higher creatinine. But after 60 days, essentially this difference went away, okay? 
So this, crea this increase in creatinine here, which is non-significant, it went away over time. And then looking at, this is the uh, uh, composite endpoint of death, rehospitalization, or emergency department visits, and, and bolus was just as effective as continuous in this, and low-dose furosemide was just as uh, beneficial as high-dose, okay? <clears throat> so essentially, you know, if you want to be conservative, you can do low-dose. If you want to be a little more aggressive and maybe have fewer days in the hospital, you can do the high-dose. <clears throat> but, um, and they, it, it looks very, the results are pretty similar, okay? Now, they did have uh, another study that really intensifies that quite a bit. It's a, um, an evaluation of what is called a stepwise pharmacological approach to decongestion and heart failure patients. And essentially, the goal is to have a urine output of three to five liters daily uh, during their treatment. And this was a post hoc analysis of patients from the DOSE trial, which was that LASIK trial we just talked about, the ROSE heart failure trial, and another trial we're going to talk about uh, a little later, the CARES trial, where, who had, and all of these had an increased creatinine, they, uh, uh, at least 0.3, okay? And the CARES patients, they had a specific protocol that they used. There were 91 of these patients. Essentially, the creatinine was around 2.3. Now, the ROSE and the DOSE patients, so this is the CARES heart failure study. So half of the people were just ultrafiltration. They didn't diurese. The other half were this really pretty aggressive schedule, the algorithm for diuresing patients, okay? So it's the stepwise approach. And so all of these patients had an increase in renal fun uh, function of, uh, I'm sorry, increase of creatinine of at least 0.3. So technically, cardiorenal because they had an increase uh, uh, creatinine in the setting of heart failure, okay? Then they took this, this arm of the DOSE trial, the LASIKs trial we talked about, that they took 55 of the patients there who developed a little bump in their creatinine of 0.3, and they included them and the standard therapy, and the standard therapy is that out, what we just talked about with the dose trial, where you take their home dose and you turn it into IV, or you take their home dose and you increase it two and a half percent, two, two and a half times, okay? Then they looked at the ROSE trial and they had an arm of uh, patients who developed cardiorenal syndrome, and they were also part of the standard therapy because the people in the ROSE trial they had essentially the same diuretic regimen as in the dose trial, okay? So looking at this, they, they compared this more intensive diuretic strategy to the standard th therapy, okay? And so the results were with this stepwise therapy, they had a larger net negative weight change, uh, minus 3 versus 0.8, compared to the strategy in the dose trial. They had a, a more net fluid loss, and they had an improved serum creatinine, okay, compared to the others, kind of paradoxically. So essentially, and this is such a complicated little al algorithm, but this is how you get your starting dose on the algorithm, okay? You look at their home dose, and then you, if they're on uh, 80 or less, you would give them a 40 milligram IV bolus and then put them on a Lasix drip five an hour, okay? And then you increase in a stepwise fashion as you go along. So this is day one, okay? They're looking for a three to five liter a day diuresis, okay? So you put them on the regimen, and then on day two, after 24 hours, you look at their urine output. If their urine output was too high, you could go down on their diuretic. If it was right where it needed to be, you stay at the same place. If it was less than three liters a day, then you go to the next step in this table. So in this case, you would go to an 80 bolus and increase the Lasix drip to 10 an hour and give them five of metolazone, okay? And then at each day, you do the same thing and to try to make sure that they have a, a very high urine output, three to five liters a day. When you get to 48 hours, if you need to add an inotrope, you can do that 72 hours and 96 hours, you can do inotrope, 
or you can consider advanced things like do they need an LVAD or do they need hemodialysis, you know, for ultra filtration. So this is a pretty, you know, intricate little algorithm, but it did show that they had a, a better weight loss, a better net fluid loss, and the creatinine wasn't worse, okay? So that's a pretty aggressive, they're getting three to five liters off a day, you know, they got a good response there. <clears throat> okay, so let's also, let's look at the Everest trial. This looked at Tolvaptan, okay, in the setting of decompensated heart failure. There are two identical studies, randomized, controlled, double-blind, uh, 4,100 patients hospitalized with heart failure, and they were uh, randomized to receive either Tolvaptan, 30 milligrams a day, or placebo within 48 hours. The primary endpoint was all cause mortality and cardiovascular death or hospitalization. And uh, on a short term basis, the patients receiving Tolbaptan had greater improvement, uh, greater reduced mean body weight, and improved dyspnea. Long term, overall, Tolbaptan was not inferior to standard treatment. And uh, uh, the improvement in edema was not, you know, significantly better than the other. Uh, strategy, and uh, but it did result in a much better correction of hyponatremia, and uh, people with uh, uh, CHF and heart failure tend to have hyponatremia, so this may be a good dr uh, drug to use in that setting. So this is the study uh, that uh, we kind of looked at before. This is ultrafiltration versus diuresis. There was kind of a trend in the cardiology that uh, thinking that doing ultrafiltration instead of diuresis was actually better and was uh, easier on the kidneys. And so they worked out a system, essentially this is the aqueduct system, a person had two catheters in and they would take the blood out, ultrafiltrate and return the blood to them. And uh, to qualify for the study, they had at least a 0.3 increase in their creatinine, so they were kind of technically cardiorenal. Diuretics were given to manage symptoms of congestion in one arm, and the other arm they had the ultrafiltration. So regarding the primary input of serum creatinine and body weight, there was no significant difference in, in weight loss at 96 hours, and the creatinine level actually worsened in the ultrafiltration group compared to the pharmacologic. And they had more serious adverse events. So there's really no benefit to during diuresis, you know, just to keep the kidneys from, you know, just to keep the creatinine from going up. So looking at these primary endpoints, you know, this is the, this is the um, ultrafiltration. They're just about the same. This is the uh, weight loss. So no benefit really. So essentially, uh, when you have a patient you're treating for decompensated heart failure, you want to evaluate your treatment response. You can look at uh, weight loss. You can look at loop diuretic dose, uh, requiring increases, increasing doses of a loop diuretic uh, can be a problem. Also requiring a thiazide diuretic can indicate that they're having either worse cardiac function or that that bump in the creatinine is more than just the, uh, you know, non-significant bump that you get. Uh, you look at urine output, that's, a, that's an important marker. Improvement in dyspnea and JBP. If you have a, a poor diuretic response, that can be associated with the low systolic blood pressure, high BUN, diabetes, atherosclerotic disease, and more advanced heart failure and renal impairment, and it predicts mortality and heart failure. Uh, and rehospitalization. So it's kind of a bad sign if they have a poor diuretic response. Uh, and then if they have, when they, if they're not responding to diuretics and their BUN is going up, 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 their creatinine is going up, then ultrafiltration is, is beneficial in that setting. So looking at this cardiorenal syndrome type 1, uh, decreased cardiac function leads to the 
activation of RAS, uh, sympathetic nervous system, AVP, and that increases fluid and sodium retention and leads to venous congestion. So the prognosis of cardiorenal syndrome is a little complicated. CKD at baseline leads to an increase in mortality, but worsening renal failure in the treatment of decompensated heart failure with an effective diuresis where they're getting a good urine output and improving dyspnea does not increase mortality. Okay? Poor diuretic response leads to worsening renal failure and poor prognosis. And uh, loop diuretics are the first line of therapy and uh, diuretic, diuresis that improves the symptoms also improves mortality. Okay. And ultrafiltration when response to the diuretics are ineffective. Yes. Um, you know, whenever a patient develops acute renal failure from any, any cause, the first impulse of doctors is to stop ARBs and ACE inhibitors. So from your reading of these studies, did they keep those drugs on board uh, or did they stop them? From the, from the reading, I didn't see, what I saw was there was a, a study with an allopril and keeping an allopril or introducing it as soon as possible had a huge improvement in mortality because you're addressing, you know, the grass, you know, system uh, effects that are really the cause of the problem. There's another, so yes, they, they do like to. No, no, the thing is, when you have stable yeah. chronic renal failure, I think everyone is yeah. comfortable. But in this setting, what's happening is the creatine is going right. up, right? It's going up. And so, everyone gets panicky and they actually stop these drugs which may be beneficial to these patients. So the question is, should the physician not follow his impulse to stop the drug and just leave these drugs on board? Because in general, we, we tend to stop them. Am I, I right to say that? Yes, I think so. So these studies would yeah. be informative. They, if they just left these drugs and didn't, didn't stop them, yeah. then it would be something that we should do in actual practice. Yeah, what I saw was in commentaries and things like that, that you need to reintroduce these drugs as soon as possible. I didn't see anything in the studies about that, but there is a, there is literature that with the CKD at baseline, having this enalapril has a huge mortality benefit. And there's another study where they look at losartan and uh, a losartan of 50 milligrams versus 150 milligrams and the setting of heart failure and the 150 milligrams had a much better effect uh, on mortality. So those are, those are good drugs, reintroduce them as soon as possible and you don't, I think after the initial, you know, treatment, uh, after the initial uh, treatment for uh, uh, heart failure, if they are stopped, to reintroduce them as soon as possible because the, what they're showing is over time, over weeks, months, even if they do have a bump in creatinine, over time it evens out and, and it's not significant in terms of mortality. Just a comment. Uh, so the, the rise in creatinine and, and, and it's not always associated with uh, an increased bad outcome or, or mortality. I think it probably alludes to that understanding that we have now, there are probably two types of AKI. There is this functional AKI where there is nothing structurally wrong with the kidney, but there may be just a reduction in GFR because of a pre-renal etiology or a decreased perfusion to the kidney versus a structural AKI uh, where there is actually damage to the kidney. So, so that one particular study that we showed is really interesting where the patients who actually had the structural injury actually did better uh, versus the patients where the Kim and the NGAL did not go up because those biomarkers are markers of structural injury to the kidney. So I'm curious to know whether the patients that were included in the study also included CKD patients because in CKD patients those markers don't go up as much as compared to normal patients. So 
perhaps the CKD patients which we know will have a higher mortality did not show the same intensity of the MGAL enhanced, whereas the patients who had normal kidneys had a more pronounced MGAL response. Uh, I do not know that. So you're saying the patients in the study with the looking at the biomarkers? Right. You said that the patients who had where the biomarkers went up, they did better. Their mortality well, was they didn't go way up. They didn't go way up like in the in the cabbage studies where the NGAL goes through the roof. You know, yeah, so they, they, not think of it as they uh, essentially they were worried about the dilution <coughs> of the urine, giving a spuriously low uh, amount uh, uh, quantity for the biomarker. So they indexed it to a uh, spot creatinine. Okay, and so what they found was it was just a little high. It wasn't tremendously high. Yeah, but it was kind of on the higher side. Those people who had a higher, in just, you know, not an abnormal range, but just a higher level seemed to do better. But it, I don't think it was any indication that there was a tubular injury and that the, um, yeah, that the, um, the tubule was being damaged. Okay, thank you.